friend of yours, would you go in? Yes, I replied without false hesitation. Me too. So we might as well take a look and get it over and done with. We crossed the threshold. There was a heavy black plastic curtain separating it from the street, beyond which was another world, another dimension. I remember everything as if I had it in front of me right now. The lighting was harsh and cold, like a morgue scene in a film, and the space much bigger than might have been imagined. From outside it looked like a small shop, just a few square meters. Once past the curtain, though, you realized it was wide and very deep. There were shelves on the walls, display cabinets along the whole central part, and five or six customers walking about, carefully avoiding each other's eyes. The only employee was a thin, nondescript boy, not much older than me, sitting behind the cash register playing chess with himself. Video cassettes and magazines were pedantically divided by theme. Orgies, lesbians, S&M, gay, whips, animals. The wide range of objects and implements really was for all tastes, and there were oils and creams promising in four different languages spectacular increases in size. Up to eight centimetres, it said on a box alongside drawings that left nothing to the customer's imagination. Now and again I checked what my father was doing. He seemed at ease, moving between one shelf and the next, examining each thing carefully, almost as if he were planning to write a review of the business and was looking for a starting point. At one point he picked up a whip, a cat of nine tails to be precise, and tested it by hitting himself gently on the forearm. At the far end of the room was a line of booths. I went closer to take a look. There was a slot machine next to each door. If you inserted five francs, you could go in, choose a film from a vast selection, classified according to subject areas as on the shelves, and enjoy a private view for a few minutes with its related privileges. On each door there was a sign saying, Prier de laisser cet endroit aussi propre que vous désirez le trouver en entrant. Please leave this place as clean as you would like to find it on entering. I was tempted to put in the five francs, but I had only just put my hand in my pocket in search of coins when I heard a series of loud, inarticulate guttural sounds, like somebody energetically clearing his throat. They were coming from one of the booths, and were accompanied by laboured breathing in a rapid crescendo that concluded with a rather impressive rattle. A few moments later, an old man emerged from the booth in question. He stank of cigarettes and was trying to button up his visibly stained fly. It was likely he hadn't obeyed the request on the sign. I instinctively took my hand out of my pocket and realized that my father was close by. Shall we go? He said in a neutral tone. We headed for the exit. The chess-playing assistant didn't deign to look at us. I wondered how they managed to check if people were stealing. For a while we walked in silence. I remember when I was little you sometimes played the piano, I said. The one we still have at home. Yes, that's right. But I don't remember what you played. A bit of everything. But yes, mainly classic jazz. Did you study music as a boy? I never heard about that. I went to a teacher for several years. But I learned to play what I liked only when I stopped taking lessons. In my university years, three friends and I put together a group, piano, drums, bass, and sax. We earned a bit of money, playing in dance halls or at weddings. It was fun. For years, we even talked about making a record of our own. Then we graduated, and we each went our way, which didn't involve music. Did you compose? Yes, we wrote a few pieces. Two or three were actually quite good, in my opinion. How long is it since you last played? Every now and again, I still play a little. But where you live, you don't have a piano. He shook his head, still walking. So, how do you manage? I go to a friend who sells them and practice a bit. I always choose a different one. Why didn't you take the piano away with you? I don't know. Maybe leaving something you care about in a place you don't really want to leave is a way of staying connected to that place. Of hoping to get back there. I don't know. This left me stunned. If he had decided to leave my mother and me, what did these words mean? I didn't ask him for any other explanation. I would have had to bring too many things out in the open, and I couldn't. I wasn't ready. 
What kind of music are you interested in? My father asked. Eh, I'm not a great fan. I listen to singer-songwriters, some singer-songwriters, rock music, songs that tell a story or stir your imagination. I'm more interested in the words than the music. Give me an example. I thought this over for a few seconds. There's a song I very much like. It's by Don McLean. I don't suppose the name means anything to you. I've heard it. What's the name of the song? American Pie. It's based on something that happened in 1959, a plane crash in which three musicians died. It's full of symbols, and I like listening to it because every time I think I discover a new meaning or a hidden episode. It lasts nearly nine minutes. I'd like to hear it, he said without any condescension. Okay, when we get back, I'll lend you the record. He gave an uncertain smile. The fact is, I know hardly anything about you. I have no idea what you want, what you'd like to do. But maybe that's true of all parents. He could not know what I didn't know myself. I don't know what I want, I admitted. I've asked myself, and it was like staring into a void. If I tell you something, will you promise me you won't start worrying? It's all behind me now. I won't start worrying, I promise. I've sometimes wondered how it must be to kill yourself. He didn't change expression. In what way? Precisely, that was the problem. I couldn't find a method that seemed sure. I mean, that made me feel certain I wouldn't suffer in any way. Do you still think about it? No, not for a while now. I've had the same thoughts. Really? When I was in high school. Then one evening, near the end of university, I happened to talk about it with some friends. One of us had taken his final exam and was about to graduate. We drank quite a bit, started confiding in each other, and at one point I admitted I'd thought about suicide. I thought my friends would be shocked, and in a way they were, but not for the reason I'd imagined. It had happened to all of us, and yet each of us was convinced it was something very rare, something exclusive. We were silent for a while. There are moments that imprint themselves on our memory, indelibly, because something happens that changes how we see the world. And it does happen in a moment. That anecdote about suicide jolted me out of the adolescent cocoon I'd lived in until then. The cocoon in which you think your own experiences are unique, indescribable, tragic, and above all, incomprehensible to anyone else. A boy from my school killed himself a year ago. I know, I remember. Really? I'd have liked to talk to you about it, but uh, I didn't know how. Did you know him well? No, only by sight. We'd played soccer together behind the school a couple of times. Did they ever find out why he did it? I opened my arms wide. Nobody could figure it out. There are short circuits in people's minds and souls that nobody will ever manage to pinpoint. Trying to explain them, you could go mad. He took out his cigarettes again. Do you think you should smoke that much? I blurted this out, surprising even myself. He looked at me for a few seconds, then he put the pack and the matches back in his pocket. We had come to a crossroads. My father stopped to look at the map. There was nobody around. Uh, this way, he said, pointing to a street on our left. I think we're nearly there. Sixteen. Block after block, the city had changed. Now we were in a half-deserted area on the outskirts, with a few cars parked here and there. There were yards full of weeds and refuse, nasty smells, ghostly boarded-up buildings, housing estates that seemed uninhabited with the odd dim light in the windows, tall dilapidated fences behind which disused warehouses could be glimpsed. Over it all there hovered a sense of desolation and neglect. A small pack of dogs crossed the street, a sheepdog crossed at the head of the procession, the others following in a disciplined single file. In a kind of choreography, they reminded me of the sleeve of Abbey Road. They disappeared one by one into a side street, fading into the darkness, and a few moments later, I wondered if I had really seen them. Are you sure this is the right place? He showed me the map. The name of the street we were crossing corresponded to the one Dominic had written on the piece of paper. It should be this way, but it's definitely a strange place for a music venue. 
I'm taking this anyway, I said, picking up a rusty iron bar, the kind used in reinforced concrete. He appeared about to say something. Don't do anything stupid. Leave that thing, something like that. They must have thought that, considering the surroundings, arming ourselves wasn't a completely mistaken idea. We kept on walking. A taxi drove past us and stopped a hundred meters farther on. Three people got out and walked in somewhere, while the taxi moved away quickly, as if the driver didn't want to stay in the area a minute longer. Maybe it's there, I said. I think it is, my father said, going nearer. The half-closed gate led to a yard at the far end of which was a low building with a green and purple sign, En Fusion. I threw away the iron bar and we approached. Some cars were parked near the building and in front of the entrance stood two forbidding-looking men. One was tall and fat with the smooth face of a depraved Buddha. The other was his opposite, thin and dark with muscular arms that looked like leather ropes. Neither of them looked like people you would want to get into an argument with. They asked us if we had an invitation. My father said, no, we didn't have an invitation. We didn't know we needed one. But Dominic from Chez Papa had suggested we come to hear music. The mention of Dominic worked. They exchanged looks. The fat man, who seemed to be in charge, nodded. The thin man asked us for a hundred francs each, didn't issue any tickets, and let us through. It was a large space with not much light and a lot of people. Wide open windows, a smell of cast iron, smoke and bodies. On one side there was a bar with a wooden counter and sawdust on the floor all around. On the other, up against a wall of time-worn bricks, a bandstand onto which the musicians were climbing at that very moment. Dad lit a cigarette. Strange place, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'll have a drink, but maybe it's best if you... Me too! Gaston said I should do everything a normal 18-year-old would do, and we have to follow doctor's orders. My father raised his hands in surrender. We went to the bar and ordered two cocktails, perroquets they were called, made with pastis, green mint syrup, water and ice. The kind of cool, pleasant drink you knock back like certain drinks you had as a child, and which before long muddles your brain and makes your legs shake. I looked at the people. They were all older than me. But there were lots of girls. Some were young and some were beautiful, and some wore tight skirts or trousers and were cheerfully vulgar. And I wondered what might happen during that infinitely long night I had in front of me, and on all the other nights of my new life, because I was thinking then that I would have a new life, and I told myself gleefully that I was feeling good, and that not sleeping wasn't so bad after all. Maybe you could learn to do without it, because that way time would become much longer and much more interesting. The musicians on the bandstand alternated. Every quarter of an hour the drummer or the saxophone player or the bassist or the trumpeter changed. They were all men, apart from a girl who played the drums for a while with wild eyes and an expression that seemed to hide a secret guilt. Only the pianist stayed the same, a guy in a white shirt, a black tie and a grey borsalino, pulled back to leave his forehead uncovered. Before every piece he would light a cigarette, inhale a few times and let it burn itself out in the ashtray, the smoke describing lethal curlicues in front of his face. It was a jam session, my father explained. That's when musicians get together to play without a prearranged program, sometimes without even knowing each other, and take turns improvising on standards. What's a standard? Right, a standard is... How can I put it? A really famous jazz piece that over time has become a classic, something that everyone knows. A theme, a kind of musical grid to improvise on. A framework. A table became free just in front of the musicians, and we went and sat down at it. My father was right. I thought I'd never heard jazz. I mean, I'd never heard it deliberately. But in among the dissonances, the solos, the give and take, the quotations, I did recognize something. He seemed happy. I can't find a less banal word to describe it. Whenever they launched into a new piece, he would mention the title and the composer. Then he would listen, rapt, keeping time, nodding his head at the most successful passages. Now there were four people playing, piano, drums, bass, and trumpet. The drummer had long grey hair, tied in a bun, and kept looking around as if searching for someone who wasn't there. He was sweating a lot, 
and now and again would wipe his face with a towel. The guy who was playing the bass was tall and handsome, looked straight ahead and seemed shy. He had his arms around the instrument like a bridegroom hugging his bride in an old photograph. The trumpeter was a black man in his fifties, with pockmarked skin and eyes expressing terminal boredom. Nobody knows the things I've seen, and I don't want to talk about them anyway. He was there, but he didn't give a damn. He didn't give a damn about anything, except the music he was playing, the notes that rose and fell languidly and painfully and hypnotically, while he closed his eyes and the veins on his neck swelled. And it seemed as if he and his trumpet were in search of an idea hidden somewhere in the air, in search of a secret rule, the key to everything. My father was drumming on the table with his open hand and tapping with his foot on the floor. He was looking at the musicians. Actually, he was looking mostly at the trumpeter, and a vague smile hovered over his lips. I don't know anything about it, I said after a while, but I get the feeling the one playing the trumpet is the best. He is. The others are playing quite well, but he's the one who really has intention. I was about to ask him what he meant by intention, but he went on. The piece is called So What? It's by Miles Davis, one of the greatest musical geniuses of this century. Actually, we can leave out of this century one of the greatest musical geniuses of all time, someone who changed the history of music. Just then, or maybe later, but our minds tend to adjust memories to give them more meaning and order than the events to which they refer actually had, a guy got up on the bandstand and approached the pianist. He whispered something in his ear, and the pianist picked up his glass from the floor, stood up, apologized to the other musicians, bowed slightly to the audience, lowered his hat over his forehead, and walked away to a smattering of applause. The others stopped playing while the same guy who had spoken to the pianist turned to the audience, us, and asked if there was anyone who wanted to play the piano. Nobody stepped forward, so he repeated the invitation two or three times without success. My father shifted on his chair, as if he'd had the impulse to stand up but then had thought better of it and told himself, Don't do anything stupid, Professor. Let it go. Do you want to go up? I asked under my breath. No, uh, no, better not, he replied under his breath. Why better not? I mean, if you can do it, why not go? Better not, he said again, keeping his eyes fixed on the bandstand and the empty piano stool. Go! And, without even realizing what I was saying, I added, I'd love to hear you play. He turned slowly toward me and looked me in the eyes to see if he'd understood correctly. Then he nodded, stood up, and waved his hand to attract the attention of the guy on the bandstand. As he walked to the piano, I suddenly felt scared that he wouldn't be up to it. As a young man, he had played at weddings and student parties, and now he practiced from time to time on borrowed pianos. In other words, he was an amateur at best, and maybe I'd sent him up to make a fool of himself in front of these unknown French people, who would have no qualms about booing and humiliating him. Oh, why hadn't I kept quiet, I asked myself. I sucked the melted ice at the bottom of my glass through the straw, feeling that something irreparable was about to happen. Dad sat down, immediately stood up again and adjusted the stool, tried a couple of chords, stretched the muscles of his neck, looked down at the keyboard and tried again. Then he raised his head and looked at the other musicians one by one. So what? the trumpeter said. Ça va? Ça va, my father replied. And they started playing without saying anything more. At first he was cautious, wary. I didn't know much about music, let alone that particular kind of music. But I had the impression he wasn't playing enough notes, that he was a little tense, that he was feeling his way, trying to get in sync with the others, searching for a point of entry. Then, gradually, the keys seemed to free themselves. The sounds of the piano appeared to become fuller and richer, and he launched into a dialogue with the others, like somebody politely joining in an already started conversation. I was watching his every gesture in a state close to anguish. It was also alien to my image of him, so mysterious. There were times when he closed his eyes, times when he swayed back and forth. His hands were nimble, rapid. Their movements conveyed a sense of simplicity that was very beautiful, 
like a well-managed metaphor, an ideal of style, a way of being in the world. They had been playing for about ten minutes, and the trumpeter was in the middle of a solo when the pianist in the Borsalino reappeared at the side of the bandstand. He stood there, listening and smiling. My father saw him and nodded in his direction as if to say, OK, I've seen you. I'll hand it over to you now. The other man replied with a gesture as if to say, Keep playing. My father smiled. The trumpeter noticed this, so he wasn't as absent as I'd thought, launched a series of conclusive notes, turned in the direction of my father, and gave way to him. Go on, it's your turn, said the simple measured turn the pockmarked black man made with his body, with his head, with his trumpet. A sign of respect for the amateur pianist who'd had the courage to get up on the stage and play with them. And Dad played a solo. I would never have admitted it to myself, but I was really proud of him and wished I could tell everyone near me that the tall, thin, elegant-looking man sitting at the piano, looking much younger than his fifty-one years, was my father. When he finished, summing up the meaning of what he had played in two conclusive, melancholy scales, there was a burst of friendly applause, and I also applauded and kept doing so until I was sure he had seen me, because I was starting to realise that there are such things as misunderstandings, and I didn't want there to be any at that moment. In the years to come, I would listen to a fair amount of jazz in its various manifestations and forms. I would learn concepts I knew nothing about that night in Marseille. Variations, paraphrases, dissonance, clusters, chromaticism, interplay, modal improvisation, free jazz. But all I really understand about jazz, however much or however little, I learned that night. Seventeen. We decided to go back on foot the way we'd come. We could have called a taxi, but we told each other that if we wanted to kill time, it was better to walk. Kill time? <laughs> what a stupid phrase, my father said. We don't need to kill it. It passes by itself. It doesn't need any help from us. I sometimes think about these set phrases and wonder where they come from. Some are really absurd. The cat's whiskers, for example. What does it mean? I used to know... But I've forgotten. It's a phrase I've always hated. Maybe because a teacher in middle school who I hated was always saying it. I saw the iron bar I'd left on the ground when we arrived, and after thinking about it for a few seconds, I picked it up. <laughs> Just to be on the safe side. As before, he didn't say anything, this time without even thinking about it. I read a good phrase about the passing of time, he said, kicking a plastic bottle. What was it? It got late. Very early. I laughed, although I wasn't old enough to fully understand the deadly accuracy and truth of that short phrase. I never would have imagined you played like that, I said after a few blocks. <laughs> I was shit scared when I sat down, but luckily it didn't go too badly. It was one of my favourite pieces. I didn't even think I'd like jazz. And did you? Yes, I did. Although I couldn't explain why. The nice thing about jazz is its imperfection. Imperfection in the etymological sense of the word. I don't know what you're talking about. Perfect comes from the Latin perficere, to do something completely. Imperfection, in the etymological sense, is that which isn't complete. Incompleteness distinguishes jazz from any other kind of music. In classical music, for example, the score contains all the notes to be played. The performer reads it and plays the written notes. Nothing less, but also nothing more. His performance is all about the many different ways he can interpret those notes, but the notes are always the same. In jazz, the score is just the starting point. Does that have to do with what you told me earlier about standards? That there's a grid that the musicians improvise on? That's right. You start with the standard, in other words, with the notes written in the score. And then you go off in search of other things. Other things that you don't know before you start. The player is also the composer of the piece he's playing. You said the man on the trumpet had intention. What did you mean? He lit a cigarette and slowed down a little as he walked, as if to concentrate and collect his thoughts. Well, that's one of those concepts.
spots where St. Augustine's words about time are valid. If nobody asks me, I know. If I try to explain to someone who asks me, I no longer know. He finished his cigarette before he resumed speaking. Let's put it this way. Your intention is where you want to get to when you're playing a piece, or rather, to be more precise, it's where you want to get to, but also how you want to get there. It's the destination, but also the route. There may be many kinds of intention, serious, dramatic, frivolous, or clever or witty. I can't explain it any better than that. The trumpeter seemed very serious. He was very serious. We passed a guy in pyjamas with a big mastiff on a leash. Man and dog looked at us suspiciously. It was obvious we didn't belong in this place. So what were we doing there in the middle of the night? Speaking of time, I looked at my watch and wondered if he was taking the dog for its last walk of the night or its first of the morning. How are you? My father asked me after another few blocks. Fine. And you? I'm fine too. I don't feel tired at all. It was 2.40. We were walking quickly and were both wide awake and in a good mood. In a way, I was starting to grasp the mysteries of the city in which we had been moving for many hours now. It was as if I sensed its hidden spaces, its secret lives, the windows where people's silhouettes passed for a moment and disappeared forever. I glimpsed in the broken lines of those streets the hidden code of my present life, and above all, my future one. Dad's eyes were slightly blurred, his expression intent but also light. What do you think? Are we lost? I asked him. I think we are. Shall we check the map? What does it matter? He replied with a hint of carefree madness in his voice. After all, we don't have any commitments. I looked at him for a few moments to see if he was being serious. He wasn't being serious, but nor was he joking, I concluded. Somebody said that losing your way in a city doesn't mean much, but getting lost in a city, the way you would get lost in a forest, is something you have to learn. So we tried to learn how to get lost. Before long, we were gripped by an inner fever. We were thinking differently, seeing things inside and outside ourselves we would never otherwise have noticed. Sometimes I wonder what it really means to be free, I said out of nowhere. I don't think there's such a thing as freedom without a certain element of risk, of insecurity. Freedom is an uncertain balance. It's being a little out of place. I like the idea of feeling out of place. Your mother and I said that many years ago. Then several minutes passed in which all that could be heard was the slight whistle of his smoker's breath, the muffled noise of the occasional car that passed us and disappeared, the sound of our footsteps. It looks like there's a bar open over there, I said, seeing a lighted sign in the distance. Let's go and have a coffee. Okay, but leave that thing outside, he said pointing to the iron bar, which I was now carrying casually, like a service weapon. If we get into an argument, it might be better to trust our dialectical talents. 18. The place wasn't welcoming. The light was cold and harsh, and on the walls were posters of soccer players from both Olympique Marseille and the French national team, and other posters of guys in shorts and boxing gloves, kicking each other in the face with the words Savate Championnat National Francais, 1981, or something like that. On a high shelf next to the posters, a number of cups were on display. Behind the filthy old wooden counter with its marble top was a man my father's age, who looked like a slum version of a Hanna-Barbera character, a slightly surly Ranger Smith with a three-day stubble. On one side of the interior, there were a few metal tables, which must once have been blue. At one of these, three guys were sitting. In front of them, they had little glasses containing an amber liquid. They were smoking big, unfiltered cigarettes and arguing in loud, animated voices. Seeing us, they fell silent for a few seconds. My father asked the barman if we could sit down, and he nodded, and in an obvious effort at politeness, even gestured with his hand toward one of the free tables. We ordered two coffees. The barman asked if we also wanted a splash of pastis in them. My father thought about it and said it was better not, adding that we had to stay awake. For some mysterious reason, Ranger Smith liked this answer, and even almost smiled. 
Dad, I was thinking, I'm the one who has to stay awake. Why don't we go back to the hotel and you sleep a little? I'll read. I feel fine. No. If I don't keep an eye on you, you might fall asleep too, and we'll be back to square one. I was about to say something in reply, but he continued. And anyway, I don't feel like sleeping. I like staying awake. I've always thought of sleep as a duty. Being given permission to do without it gives me a sense of freedom. There wasn't much to add, so I changed the subject. But then we need to decide what to do tomorrow, or rather, today, in just a few hours. What time is it? A quarter past three? The barman brought us our coffees and asked us if we were Italian. We said we were, and he immediately became friendlier. He told us his grandfather was from Sorrento. His name was Gerard Iaccarino, and even though he was born in Marseille and had never been to our country, he felt half Italian. He spoke a hybrid language that even I managed to understand. The previous year, in the final of the World Cup, he had supported Italy, after Germany had stolen the game from France on penalties in the semi-final. The best player in Italy, in his opinion, wasn't Paolo Rossi, but Claudio Gentile, and Italy had won the cup because it had the best defence in the world. What kind of sport is that? I asked, pointing to the posters with the men in boxing gloves kicking each other in the face. Savat, he replied, a sport born in Marseille. It was like boxing, but you could also use your legs. One of the guys on the poster was his son, who'd come second in the French championships in 1981. Four young men came in, talking excitedly over each other, as if something had just happened that they had widely divergent opinions about. Gerard Iaccarino went back to his place behind the counter. I don't remember how we ended up talking about sex, but after a while... I asked my father if I could ask him a personal question. Go ahead. A very personal question. If it's too personal, I'll tell you I don't feel like answering it. I liked that answer. Except that now I actually had to ask that very personal question. And formulating it out loud wasn't easy. Ah, uh, I was wondering. I mean, I wanted to ask you how old you were when you were... With a girl, for the first time. He took a deep breath. He let ten seconds or so pass, maybe even more. I was nineteen, he said at last, but his expression suggested he hadn't finished his answer. We were silent for a while. I had never talked about this subject with my friends. Some, like me, had never been with a girl. Others had, and I was embarrassed to ask them what it was like, how you were supposed to behave and all the rest. I was afraid I'd look like a loser. I was afraid of being made fun of. I was afraid they might think of me as a pathetic failure who at almost eighteen hadn't yet been with anyone, who asked morbid questions and masturbated like a thirteen-year-old. After a rapid calculation, I realized that if it had happened when Dad was nineteen, it hadn't happened with my mother. This made the conversation less difficult. He resumed, as if he had reorganized his thoughts. Almost all my friends had already been with a woman. I was one of the few not to have had the experience. I'd never imagined that. In my father's time, so many had already done it by the time they were nineteen. There are lots of clichés, I told myself. We always think that in our parents' day, most people didn't experience sex for real until they got married. Basically, that everything was less free. Were you together? Was she the same age as you? He gave a slight smile. I thought he was going to take out his cigarettes and light one, but he didn't. It wasn't so easy at the time for someone, for a girl to have complete sexual relations before marriage. For men it was different. There were always whorehouses, brothels. It was obvious, but it had never even remotely crossed my mind. The thought that my father had been with whores struck me as inconceivable. In reality, I couldn't even imagine it after those words. Even just the linguistic possibility of putting my father together with the word whore was absurd. Does that make you uncomfortable? I was about to lie, then told myself it would be a lack of respect, a way of going backward from the unexpected point we'd reached. A little, to be honest, I hadn't expected it. Well, it'd make me uncomfortable too. And it did make me uncomfortable for a long time, having done something like that. Before it happened, I used to say it would never happen. Afterward, I wondered for a long time how it had been possible. But 
How did it work? I mean, did you just go to one of those places and knock on the door and go in? What did you say? I'd never have summoned up the courage. I never would, I think. I thought the same thing. But then some friends took me. They told me it was normal. Necessary, in fact, because that way I'd learn, and I wouldn't run the risk of making a fool of myself when I ended up going with a woman I wasn't paying. Silence fell. The next thing would have been to tell the story, but maybe we weren't ready for something like that. Maybe we never would be. How was... I mean, what was she... She was normal. A bit fat, but normal. She looked like the caretaker of the apartment block next to mine. She looked so much like it that for a few moments I thought it actually was her. The whole thing lasted three or four minutes. This time he did light a cigarette, and after a few puffs his features relaxed a little. For a long time I thought that if I could only turn the clock back I wouldn't have gone to that brothel. I was filled with longing for that first time I'd never had, something I could have remembered with tenderness instead of with shame. A lot of times we don't realize that the things we do for the first time are points of no return, for good and, above all, for ill. If they're wrong, nobody will ever give them back to us. He finished his coffee and smoked. You know, I'd never have thought of telling this story, let alone telling it to my son. Did you ever tell Mom? A few months after we got together. The first time, I mean, the conversation happened to get round to brothels. There was a big debate in Parliament and in the county about the possibility of abolishing them, which did in fact happen later, in 1958, I think. Your mother was full of contempt for brothels, for those who ran them, and especially those who visited them. <laughs> I can just see her, I laughed. She said that a man who goes with a prostitute is either a lowlife or inadequate, or both. I tried to say that was a bit simplistic, a bit too tranchant. Lots of men, for generations and generations, had had their sexual initiation, let's call it that, with an older woman, a governess sometimes, or indeed a prostitute. Did that mean that all of them, generation after generation, were low lives or inadequate, or low lives and inadequate? What did she say to that? Obviously, there was no way not just to convince her, but even to get her to soften her position. You know better than I do how severe she can be in her judgments. Anyway, at the end of the conversation, I said, as usual, that she was perfectly entitled to think the way she liked, but that, to me, it seemed perhaps a bit too drastic. You needed to see shades of grey. I didn't like the idea of women's bodies being treated like merchandise either. Still, I didn't share her extreme views, things like that. Basically, I tried to maintain my position, but I couldn't wait to change the subject. I don't think I would ever have told her about my experience anyway. But that conversation made it impossible to ever bring it up. I knew what he meant, especially when it came to certain subjects. Mom didn't go in for shades of grey, and could be very harsh. I was well aware of that. And yet the way Dad was telling me this story offered a new perspective, not only on him, but on him and her. On the balance, or lack of it, in their relationship, uh, the power struggle between them. Antonio? Yes? Don't tell her the story. I don't want her to know. I'd never do that. I know, but I thought I should say it anyway. If a week earlier, or even two days earlier, anyone had told me that my father had been with a prostitute, I would have been disgusted. Now, though, I couldn't work out my feelings about that revelation. I felt a mixture of surprise, curiosity, and something like tenderness. I was very confused, and he had fallen silent. Then I realized that he was waiting for me to reciprocate, to tell him something about me. I've never been with a girl. I mean, I've never had complete sex. Sometimes I think it'll never happen. It'll happen soon, and then your current worries will seem very strange. He lit a cigarette. Have you ever smoked? I've never touched a cigarette. When did you start? Ugh, we all smoked when we were kids, including loose cigarettes. How do you mean? You didn't have to buy a whole pack. You could go to a tobacconist and ask for, I don't know, five cigarettes, and he'd put them in a thin white paper bag. That lasted until the 60s. Then loose cigarettes were banned because they said it encouraged young kids to smoke. <laughs> Which was true. Have you ever tried to quit? He smiled, ignoring the question. He was thinking about something else. 
I've never really liked any other woman since your mother, he said, as if resuming a conversation he'd interrupted a long time ago. 19. One day I'd heard my parents talking about a colleague of theirs, a university professor, an important one, a rector or a dean, who had left his wife for a female student. You know those occasions when adults talk, convinced that the children can't hear them, and that even if they do hear them, they won't understand what they're talking about? As children, all of us have listened to at least one conversation like that, so we should know how it works. Instead of which, once we've become adults, we forget it and think children are deaf or stupid, and we let them hear and understand or misunderstand things we'd rather they didn't hear and understand, let alone misunderstand. That conversation made a big impression on me. A man of fifty, in other words, quite a bit older than my father at the time, had got together with a young woman of twenty-five. I knew that professor. He and his wife had come over for dinner several times. He was a short, round, aloof man, with a little beard streaked with grey and glasses with thin frames. For some reason I took a great dislike to him. If I'd been able to categorise him according to age, from my point of view as a child at elementary school, I would have said he was almost an old man, someone closer to my grandparents than my parents. The main thing I thought I understood from what Mum and Dad were saying, while I pretended to read a Spider-Man comic, was that a couple might separate and divorce, but that it wasn't right for a university professor to get together with one of his students. It wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last, my mother said after a while in a conclusive tone. That was the concept that stayed with me, a kind of revelation of how things go in the world. Very grown-up men, let's say almost old men, university professors in particular, leave their wives for their students. That's wholly reprehensible but unfortunately it happens with some frequency. Two years or so later, my father moved out. Everything happened in quite a civilized way. Mom and Dad summoned me into the dining room and told me there are times when a husband and a wife, even though they love each other, feel the need for a break so that they can be alone and have time to think. You mean you're getting a divorce? I asked, trying to overcome my panic during a pause in the flow of words with which they had filled the silence of that October afternoon. The word divorce had always struck me as mysterious and slightly disturbing, exotic, something that concerned other people in other places. They shook their heads almost in unison and launched into a subtle and for me at the time incomprehensible disquisition on the differences between divorce and separation. They weren't getting a divorce. They were just taking a break. Well, Let's say it was a temporary separation in order to overcome certain difficulties. But I mustn't worry, as far as I was concerned, everything would stay the same. Dad was going to be in a different place for a while, I would stay with Mom, but I would be free to go and see him whenever I wanted. I would be free to stay with one or the other, depending on what I wanted and so on. I would be free. The substantial legal differences between the institutions of divorce, separation and a break were rather lost on me. What wasn't lost on me, though, was that my mother and my father were telling lies, that things wouldn't be the same, and that, when it came down to it, my father was leaving, just like his colleague, with the little grey-flecked beard and the glasses with the awful frames. Which meant he was leaving my mother, and me, for a student of his who wasn't much more than twenty. I was sure of this from the very moment that discussion in the dining room ended even though there was no clear evidence pointing to it. Actually, the fact that they hadn't mentioned any specific reason for this break convinced me that there was such a specific reason, but that they didn't want to tell me. And they didn't want to tell me because it was something improper, even shameful. Because of that, I started to harbor an unspoken hostility toward my father, but also toward my mother, for a different and complementary reason. He had done something wrong, something immoral. She, on the other hand, had done something inappropriate and annoying. She had behaved in much too civilized and compliant a manner. He had left, performing an act that she herself some time earlier had considered inadmissible. So how could she be so calm, so accommodating? She should be getting angry. She should be making him pay. She should be getting him to feel how unfair his behavior was. Not even for a second 
in the weeks, months, and years that followed, did it ever cross my mind that my interpretation was simply the fantasy of a child made angry and unhappy by the breakup of his family. It didn't matter a jot that over the years I didn't find in my father's little apartment any clue, not just that another woman was living there, but even that one had passed through. This lack, I thought with fanatical conviction, pointed to the precautions they were taking not to be found out. With adolescence and with what happened to me, I stopped thinking about my father's phantom girlfriend, but my hostility toward him didn't disappear. I simply stopped being conscious of it. It became a simmering resentment, a background murmur in my mind, something you only become aware of when it suddenly ceases, giving way to silence or a different sound. My father's words, I've never really liked any other woman since your mother, uttered that night in that bar, in some vague part of a strange city, didn't square with what I had always imagined about my parents' separation. 20. We left the bar at about 4.30, after trying the hot buttery croissants that had just arrived from a nearby bakery. We asked Monsieur Yaccarino to explain where we were and what direction to take to get back to our hotel. If he wondered how or why we had ended up in this area, he didn't let on. He pointed out the way. If I'd trusted to my intuition, I'd have gone in exactly the opposite direction, telling us that on foot it would take us at least three quarters of an hour. If we wanted, he added, he could try to call us a taxi, but he wasn't sure it would come to this address. We said no thanks, we could do with the walk. We said goodbye and set off. The air outside was cool, almost biting. Every now and again, passing old half-open front doors, we were hit by whiffs of mildew, damp, and urine. I see you don't step on the manhole covers, my father said after a while, smiling in the semi-darkness. What? You avoid the manhole covers. I used to do that too when I was young, and I was on my way from home to university for an exam. He was right. It was a habit I'd picked up, I don't know why, a few years earlier. By now I did it without thinking. I thought of it as a secret personal eccentricity one of the many ways I thought I was different from other people. Why? I asked. For the same reason as you. A little private superstition. Most of us have them. There are those like us who avoid manhole covers and those who deliberately step on them, but taking care not to touch the edges. Then there are those who stay away from the curb, those who walk only on the unpainted part of pedestrian crossings and so on. And when you went to your exams, I avoided the manhole covers. Sometimes I'd tell myself it was absurd, actually a worse superstition than the ones about black cats, nuns, or spilling salt. I'd tell myself it was unworthy of a rational, mathematical mind like mine. And yet for four years, I never stepped on a manhole cover on the way from home to university on exam days. I was too worried that something unpleasant might happen, and I didn't want to run the risk. Anthropologists call it magical thinking. Magical thinking, yes, it's the mental mechanism by which we see meanings where there aren't any. Imagine non-existent relations of cause and effect and convince ourselves we can influence reality through our thoughts or through symbolic or ritual acts. Magical thinking is the principle behind belief in the evil eye or lucky charms. Uh, I don't know if I've explained it well. No, I understand. I don't walk under a ladder because I believe it could bring bad luck, but... Between my passing under the ladder and any bad thing that might happen, there's no relation of cause and effect except in my imagination. It's all in my head. Congratulations. We all have superstitions. There's a wonderful story about Niels Bohr, one of the greatest scientists of all time. Apparently, he would put a horseshoe on the front door of his house in the country. One day, a student paid him a visit and was astonished to see that horseshoe. Professor, do you really believe a horseshoe on the front door brings good luck? No, replied Bohr, of course I don't. But it seems to work anyway. He seemed pleased to be able to tell me anecdotes and explain things. Above all, he seemed pleased by the fact that I was letting him. It hadn't happened since I was a child. As the sky started to get lighter, the streets started to fill up. People running, workers with sleepy faces, and little shoulder bags with their lunch bakers, boys delivering bread, street sweepers, policemen, nurses, as well as survivors of the night hurrying back to their lairs before the light of day turned them to ash. One of them spat as he passed us and gave us an indecipherable smile. 
My father and I had stopped talking and had been walking at a good pace for about ten minutes when I had a sudden, dizzying, twofold sensation, one I'd never had before and have only had a few times since. I felt part of a multitude and at the same time was able to gaze down at it as if from the top of a tower. People, more and more of them as dawn advanced, swarmed through streets and alleys and avenues and squares, joining and dividing and describing shapes in perpetual motion, like some flocks of birds in the sky. All of us, my father and me, the street sweepers, the workers, the louts, the policemen, the nurses, the criminals, the bakers, boys, the down and outs, formed a single giant organism of which I alone was conscious. By the time we got to the hotel, it was already day. The elevator was out of order, the doorman told us. They'd be coming to fix it at about 7.30. Our room was on the fourth floor. We walked up. By the time we got to the landing, my father was out of breath, and for a moment or two I got scared. Then it passed. This is where we have to be careful, he said, throwing the windows wide open onto apartment blocks turning pink in the early morning light. Careful? We have to rest a little, but we mustn't fall asleep. Go and have a shower and take one of those pills. I did as I was told. The warm water was pleasant, and when I finished I took the pill, even though I said I didn't need it, because I felt fine and had no desire to sleep, and I was impatient to go out again to see what adventures the day that was starting had in store for the two of us, my father and me. While he went to have a shower and a shave, I took out my Walkman and one of the mixtapes I'd made especially for the trip. I can still remember the playlist, the way we remember the members of the soccer teams we supported when we were kids. Romeo and Juliet, Private Investigations, Ragazzo dell'Europa, Should I Stay or Should I Go, Under Pressure, Katerina, Always on My Mind, in the version by Willie Nelson. I lay down on the bed, put on the headphones and pressed play. I don't know what song was playing when my eyes closed. I only remember my father in his bathrobe shaking me gently by the shoulder. So, you didn't need a pill, eh? I wasn't asleep. I was listening to music. Sure, and I was lifting weights. Go and have another shower and make it cold this time. Then we'll go out and have breakfast and work out a program for the day. 21. After breakfast, we went back up to our room to rest a little. Lying on the beds, but awake. I've studied the guidebook, my father said. Yes? Apparently, the one thing we mustn't miss is Notre Dame de la Garde. It's the church we could see from the harbour, the one at the top, all lit up. I don't know if you noticed it. Apart from the building itself, there's supposed to be a wonderful view of the city and the islands. Then we absolutely have to see the Calonque. What's that? The Calonque are geological formations, a whole lot of inlets and cliffs just outside Marseille. You can take a boat from the viewport and make a three-hour trip. What do you think? I yawned deeply and stretched. I felt quite good and the pill had started to take effect. Okay, where do we start? We can take a taxi to Notre Dame de la Garde, visit the church and enjoy the view. Then we go down to the harbour and find the key in the ticket office for the tour of the Calonque. Half an hour later we were in the taxi. My father chatted with the driver throughout the ride. Among the things I was discovering about him was an unexpected chattiness, a readiness to talk to people and take an interest in them. I wondered if he'd always been that way and had never noticed, or if it was an effect of the bewildering situation we were in. They spoke rapid, impenetrable French. I understood almost nothing of the conversation apart from the fact that the driver was originally from Brittany, that he hated the Boer, the children and grandchildren of North African immigrants, who'd taken over the city and that he would leave Marseille if only he could. Notre Dame de la Garde was a building of impressive dimensions, all in marble, near romantic in style, located at the highest point of the city. It was half past eight, the air was limpid, the whole of Marseille was at our feet, the sea glittered in the distance like a promise. Over there are the Frioul Islands, my father said, consulting the guidebook and pointing to a little archipelago very close to the view port. On the smallest of them is the Chateau d'If. It took me a few seconds to focus on the place and the name. You mean the one in the Count of Monte Cristo? Yes, it was a prison up until the beginning of the century. I didn't know it actually existed. I thought it was an imaginary place. No, it exists. 
The novel actually starts here. The Count of Monte Cristo, which I'd read twice, first in an abridged version for children, then in the complete version, was one of my favourite novels. I liked stories of adventure, injustice and revenge. I identified totally with them. And the one I liked most was that one, the story of Edmond Dantes. In the voracious, distracted way I read, though, I had never lingered over the fact that the novel was partly set in Marseille, the actual place where I was right now. I felt an exhilarating sensation, as if all at once I'd been given the opportunity to visit Smallville, or Toontown, or Gotham City. It's a pity we don't have a camera, I said, looking in all directions at the view. Yes, it is. But who'd have thought we'd need one, my father said, and the words imprinted themselves in my mind as if they were a mysterious maxim, a prophecy. We wandered around the church, looked at the giant statue of the Virgin on the bell tower, studied the city from every angle, and when we'd had enough, after a while even the most beautiful views start to cloy, we took another taxi to get down to the viewport. At the stand where you could buy tickets for boat trips to the Calonque, there was a round woman with large, very conspicuous breasts and a friendly expression. She spoke in a slow, pleasant way, carefully articulating the words, and I understood almost everything. After tearing off the tickets, she looked us up and down and asked if we had bathing costumes. No, we didn't, my father replied. Why? Was it also possible to go bathing? Of course it was, she replied. The boat would take us to small beaches where there was very clear water, more beautiful than in Corsica, she said with a hint of pride, and it would be a pity to waste the opportunity. If we liked, there was time to go to a nearby shop she could point the way to and buy what we needed. So it was that we went and equipped ourselves with bathing costumes, slides and beach towels. We also bought a cute bag decorated with fish and seahorses. We were on our way back to the quay when all at once my father stopped. What is it? I asked. He was smiling in a strange, ambiguous, almost surprised way. You know something, he said. I'm enjoying myself. Those words broke my heart. All I could do was give a vague smile and nod my head. Me too, I said, and it was true. I had never enjoyed myself so much in my life. There were ten or so people on board, apart from the boatman, a tall, broad, bearded guy with tattoos on his forearms. There was a French family, father, mother, and two silent children, and a group of German women tourists, all dressed up as if they were going for an excursion in the woods. We changed in the boat's small cabin, putting on our Marseille bathing costumes with a degree of pride. The sea was calm, with very slight ripples on which the sunlight produced a constantly changing glitter that, for some inexplicable reason, made me think of eternity. Who'd ever have thought there were such beautiful places in Marseille? Practically in the city, my father said, after we'd been sailing for half an hour, observing the white and ochre cliffs plunging vertiginously into the sea. He was wearing dark goggles over his usual glasses, a device that went back to the days when acquiring graduated sunglasses was a luxury. With such an old-fashioned accessory, his white shirt and his bathing trunks, he looked like a character from a 60s film. He was right. The coast was breathtakingly beautiful. The intense blue of the sky drew, for whoever was capable of seeing them, upside-down shapes that wedged themselves between the pointed tops of the cliffs. Some rocks seemed to defy the force of gravity. Huge boulders atop edges or points, in perfect but precarious balance, like the images in some cartoon films. High up, gargantuan primordial caves. Down below, giant crags that slid like ramps all the way down to the sea. In the distance, people could be seen lying in the sun, although it wasn't clear how they'd got there, because there was nothing behind them but steep cliffs. My father asked the boatman, who replied that there were paths, but you had to know them really well because they were steep and dangerous, and more than once inexperienced hikers had fallen from the cliffs to their deaths. In some places we passed so close to the walls of rock that we could touch them with our hands. They were hundreds of meters high and aroused an almost religious sense of reverence. We'd been sailing for more than an hour and the sun was beating down when we entered a small calonque where the sea was green and transparent. The boatman cast anchor and said that whoever wanted to could bathe. We dived in from the stern, almost simultaneously, feet first and holding our noses with our fingers. The water was cold and clear, 
and we swam together as far as a little beach of pebbles and gravel. We turned back when the boatman waved at us, signalling that we had to leave again. I'd been a small child the last time my father and I had been to the sea together. The Calonque of Monjou, which was bigger than the others, had a marina with boats and a little fishing village. My father asked if we could take a walk on land. The boatman replied that it wasn't part of the schedule, but if we liked, he could let us off and two hours later we'd be able to catch the next boat. He would inform his colleague that there were two people who needed picking up. So he dropped us at the landing stage, we waved goodbye without any regrets to the other passengers, with whom we hadn't exchanged even a word, and headed for the village. The place seemed almost uninhabited, even though there was a little bar open. We went in for a coffee and the owner pointed out to us the path that would take us in five minutes to a little beach where he said the sea was magnificent and there was almost nobody around. My father asked him how far Marseille was by land and he replied with a touch of pride that this was Marseille, 9th arrondissement. That didn't mean you could go on foot all the way to the centre, 